Hi, this is Mark Birch with quick analysis of John Donne's selected poems. So in the second stanza of Song, Go and Catch a Falling Star, Dunn imagines the kind of listener who he could have commanded to send on the missions of the first stanza. Such a person must have been born to strange sights, having witnessed them all his life. And the way in which they're accustomed to the strange is conveyed through the paradox of strange sights that are invisible to see. Um, it's that tension between sights that are invisible that creates the paradox. A sight has got to be seen, but this person that he's sending to discover, to find, to track down the impossible is used to these kind of logical impossibilities. If anybody is able to discover the near impossible, it's this particular observer, this listener. But, as Dunn's going to show, he doesn't believe even such a person as this could find a woman true and fair. The poetic voice claims that even if this person were to travel for a lifetime, they wouldn't see the most wondrous thing, the woman true and fair. He uses hyperbole to convey the extent of the search through these 10,000 days and nights. Um, I can't do the maths, but uh, that's many years. Is it about 30 years? And he also incorporates it through the physical aging process that the seeker would have to suffer uh, till age snow white hairs on thee. Uh, that word snow functions as a transitive verb in this context. It conveys the colour of the hair, but also the process of snowing and that slow, gentle, physical decline of the, the observer is therefore conveyed through the way in which the snow falls. Again, Dunn uses monometer and swear, no wear. And this creates a simplicity and abruptness that complements his own certainty that such a woman doesn't exist. A woman true and fair is interesting in terms of using those two adjectives, true and fair, in juxtaposition. True denotes honest and perhaps more importantly in this context, faithful. But the word fair also denotes honest, reinforcing the sense that an honest woman simply does not exist. However, we've also got to bear in mind that for an Elizabethan, the word would more frequently refer to beauty. To be fair was to be beautiful. So the poetic voice claims that it's impossible to find a beautiful woman who is also faithful. The final stanza begins with the conditional if. Um, because Dunn's considering what would happen if the seeker did find a woman who is true and fair. That conditional initially suggests that the poetic voice still retains some hope of finding such a woman. He describes the journey to witness this woman as a pilgrimage. And of course, that word denotes a holy journey because such a woman would be of spiritual significance. Uh, the possibility of finding her, visiting her, would be rewarding to the point of being sweet. However, Dunn presents a change of heart. He claims even if the speaker has found a woman true and fair, the poetic voice wouldn't bother making the pilgrimage, even if the journey was as close as the house next door. He claims that even if she was faithful, true, when he found her, and she remained true for the time it took to write the letter to the poetic voice to alert him to the fact that a woman true and fair had been found, she would prove faithless before he had the chance to count to three. So it's not worth going around the corner to visit her. OK, so if we conclude by taking a look at the structure of the poem, in terms of the stanzas, it's written in three nine line stanzas which is a relatively unusual verse form, although it has to be said not that unusual for Dunn, but it could complement the sense of the unusual nature of a woman who is true and fair. The metre, lines of iambic tetrameter, often missing a beat, aside from those two lines of iambic uh, monometer in each stanza. And the monometer in particular is interesting because it creates this kind of shock, uh, the shocking nature of um, women's impossibility of being both true and fair from the perspective of the poetic voice. The missing beat in the tetrameter could represent that um, elusive nature of finding such a woman. The rhyme scheme A, B, A, B, C, C, D, D, D. Um, well, I'd say it's that uh, triplet 
at uh, the end of the uh, stanzas rhyme scheme that's particularly important. It creates that awkward artificial rhythm that complements the theme of uh, the awkwardness of finding such a woman, the difficulty of doing it. There seems something a little wrong about it. And the form, of course, a dramatic monologue, which gives Dunn the opportunity to represent the character of this particular individual who presents ostensibly really misogynistic views, but I would argue could be done mocking such a person, that such a person who's clearly been hurt by someone would rage against all women in such a ridiculous manner. Um, these are extreme feelings, extreme emotions, and I don't think anyone right thinking comes away thinking women are like this. They come away thinking this person is immature and ridiculous. They're taking their hurt and throwing it out into the world in this offensive way. And I, I think Dunn could well be mocking a persona such as this. OK, thanks ever so much, folks. Take care. Ta